Hello everyone, welcome back to, for this new lesson. We're going to pick up where we left off with mutate. That means we're going to continue using this amazing verb. And this time we're going to use mutate to transform variables, but not in a global sense as we've been doing. So global means that we take our variable and we change it in a uniform manner. Now we're going to do it in a conditional sense. So basically there are different criteria and this makes that there may be like four different ways that we can change our variable, that we can transform it. So for this there's a special additional verb that we'll be using within mutate which is called case one. So we're going to explore case one today and I hope you're excited. Let's go! Welcome to this lesson. So as per usual, we're going to be starting with our learning objectives. What are our learning objectives of today? Well, the idea will be that you can transform and create new variables using case one. This seems pretty obvious. Then uh, the idea will be that you know how to use the true condition in case one to match unmatched cases. This is going to make more sense once we look a bit into it. You, can all, you will also be able to handle NA values of case one within case one, which is always important. You'll be, you will be able to understand how to keep the default value of a variable if you're only changing just a few variables using case one. You'll be able to write case one conditions that are is using multiple comparators and multiple variables. You will understand the case one condition priority order. This is pretty important and I hope you'll enjoy it. And then finally, we'll be seeing another verb, which is if else, which is very similar to case one, but which is used for binary conditions. So you might want to use it once in a while. All right, let's start. So we are going to be using packages that you are familiar with today. And then in our data sets, we'll be seeing once again our COVID-19 data set that we've been using a lot from Yaoundé, Cameroon. And then for your practice questions, you'll be using the flu data set coming to us from the outbreak in 2013 in China. Um, and so we will start by loading both of these. So for our Yaoundé data set, we've done a bit of a transformation here using case one, actually. So introduction to case one, it's right into the, the, like, the heat of the subject. Um, but um, I will not be detailing it, this too much for you because we're going to see it bit by bit throughout the lesson. So case one here is used to introduce fake NA values into our age variable. And this will be so that we can do a, the demonstration that I mentioned in the learning objectives about using NA within case one. We're also going to be renaming our age variable and then we're going to drop our age category variable using select and the minus sign. So let's run this. Alrighty, we have our Yaoundé data set that we are very familiar with, with 971 rows and then almost all the variables it contains, so 52 variables. We're going to load the flu line list. There we go, we have our smaller data set with only 136 data entries and then eight different variables. So we're going to start by talking about relational operators, comparators, because that's quite important in this lesson as we're going to be defining a lot of conditions. So these relational operators test the relation between two values. They return true, false, or NA. And here I've compiled for you a bit of a resume of a lot of different operators. So, whether so I would encourage maybe saving this or um, taking a pause of the video and having a look at it. Now, introducing case one. So we're going to start with a simple conditional transformation. We're gonna, we just removed the age category variable from the Yaoundé data set. Well now, using case one, we're going to make it again. And we are going to call it age group. All right, so we're going to start by selecting just the age years column so that we see what we are doing. We're gonna call this new data frame Yaoundé age. There we go, so we have only selected one variable. So we have a, a data set with one column. And you can see that we have our artificial NA values that we've introduced into our data frame 
with our initial transformation. So we have an Na here, fifth row, an Na here, tenth row. Let's define an adult group and a child group. So we are going to write this using the case one statement. So basically case one is within mutate. And then our condition is to be an adult or a child. So we are going to write that the age in years, if it's inferior to 18, then the person is labeled as child. However, if it's superior or equal to 18, then the person is labeled an adult. Let's run this and let's see what happens. Ta-da! First use of case one. I hope it's pretty intuitive, pretty clear. Um, here we now see that we have all of our first rows, for example, that are adults. They're all above 18. And now we have two here, which are categorized as children. And what you can already observe initially is that if you're looking at numbers, your brain is going to spot a lot more slowly which ones are children, while having a categorization variable will kind of make them jump out at you. You'll see, OK, three values, adult and a child. It's just the way that your brain is capable of perceiving information. It's also very useful to make categorizations to do further data analysis if you want to, instead of having this, these uh, data entries, have categories to work with. All right, so let's go a bit more into the case one syntax, which might seem a bit foreign. So you have this little wave sign here. It's called a tilde. And then you have two components to your case one statement. The first is you have the left hand side of the tilde, where you are going to put your conditions. So if we come back to our example here, our condition on the left hand side of the tilde, the tilde is here, it's here. Well, these are our conditions, the age inferior to 18, the age superior or equal to 18. This is our condition, it's on the left hand side. And then if we go, we have a second component, which is the right hand side, where you have the value you want to put in if the condition is true. So coming back to what we had for us, we have that if this condition is true, we input the value child. If this condition is true, we input the value adult. You can also read it as if the age is below 18, input child. Else, if the age is greater than or equal to 18, input adult, if you really want to formulate it. So this is the, the first step in the case one. And usually, as case one is quite a complex transformation, it's a good idea to inspect case one. So there are multiple ways of doing so. You can either create your new column with case one and then put it into view, which is going to open it in a separate spreadsheet. Or you can also check the proportions using table, which we already used previously. And if we run this, we would see, now see that we have a certain proportion of adults, a certain proportion of children, and a certain proportion of NA. So we can kind of check, also to, important to highlight, um, you have two percentages, one here which takes into account in the denominator the NA values, and one here which leaves them out. So very smart. It's now practice time. So your first interaction with this case one verb. You're going to use the flu lineless data and you're going to make a new column called age group within it. Sounds familiar, right? And so you're going to have an age group which is a bit different than adult and child. This time you're going to define an age group below 50 and, also, and then another one which is 50 and above. Then you have a second question which is going to require that maybe you use table because you are going to be asked what percentage of individuals in the data set are below 60. And I will see you back here for the next part of the lesson in a little while. It's now time to learn another part of the case one statement, which is this kind of maybe initially a bit obscure true default argument. So what is this true default argument? Well, it's something that is going to match any row not yet matched. We're going to kind of look at it as a default value. 
So if we're going to take the example we were using before, so to categorize people as children or adults, and so this time we're going to drop the adult categorization and we're just going to categorize people as children or not children. So the adults and the NAs will be in the same category. Let's illustrate this right away. So you have same setup as before, age group is equal to case one. Now let's write our case one statement. So age years is inferior to 18, inferior to 18. Tilde, so now the right hand side, we input the value child. Now this is where it changes. Instead of having a second condition, we're just going to write true, tilde, and then not children. When we run this, you're going to see something a bit different from before, which is that now you still have all, all the adults that are categorized as not children, but now you also have the NA, which are categorized as not children. And the children are still categorized as child. So this is where you see that the first condition is going to match the children and then anyone else, everything else, whether it's NA or adults or whatnot, if it doesn't give true for this condition, it's going to be categorized as not children. Very importantly, true should always be the final condition in case one because it matches all unmatched cases. Let's kind of look at what this would look like if we're going to run a similar code here. If we run this, then all of a sudden, well, it doesn't really matter that we put this condition as a second condition because this is going to override everything else. So here, the children that were 17 and 13 here, they're also categorized as not child. This is a brief introduction to the priority order of the conditions. We're going to get back to it in just a second. Now, onto another important thematic. As mentioned in the learning objectives, we're also going to see how to handle NAs within case one. Probably, unsurprisingly, if we're talking about NAs, this beautiful function isNA comes into play. So isNA is going to be, once again, our best ally to handle NA values, and we can write conditions targeting NA values using this function. So if we're taking, once again, what we've been working with, our condition about child, about adult, maybe we don't want the NA values just to be also labeled again NA, but we want them to be labeled missing age. Let's see how we would write a condition on the NA. We would write is NA age years tilde missing age. When we run this, we now have a new age group variable which has very three very distinct categories. So this is really important if you want to maybe highlight that the NA values correspond to missing values and it's sometimes better to have your NAs categorized rather than just floating NAs. So now it's your turn to practice. We're going to do something similar to before. That means that um, we're going to have this, categorization, this categorization below 60 and 60 and above, but this time we're going to also account for the missing age. So you have to add a condition about the NA values. The second one, that you are going to handle is that you are going to look more into the gender variable of the flu line list. So if we quickly run this, we'll see that you have these genders that are defined as F for female, M for male, and then NA values. And this is a bit unclear as a codification. So your goal will be to recode them from F, M, and NA to female, male, and missing gender using a case one statement. Welcome back. We are now going to hand to tackle another aspect of using case one. And this aspect will be that we are going to learn how to keep the fault values of a variable. So this is concretely that on your right hand side of the case one formula, you will have a variable. 
This may seem a bit obscure. We're going to get to examples in literally 10 seconds. So this is quite handy when you want to change just a few values in your variable and not too many. And so let's see an example with the highest education variable in the Yaoundé data set. So we're going to start by making a subset with just the variable of interest. That way it's easier to see what we're doing. So there we go. We have a single variable with the highest education. And now we're going to create a new variable called highest educ recode. And we're going to recode the university and doctorate entries as post-secondary. So we're going to do this as so. Highest education. We're going to use the in comparator. And we're going to list the two that we are interested in. So university and then doctorate. And then we're going to say, oops, I realized, forgot my case one statement. This is a classic. So case one, let's even put it here. Case one, when the highest education is in, is either university or doctorate, then we would define it as post secondary. So, and we close it with another parenthesis. So, this is how we would write highest educ recode. There's a case one statement that is saying that if highest education is in university or doctorate, then we give it the value post secondary. When we run this, this is what comes out. So, it worked. We have the people that are encoded as university, basically that who have done university or a doctorate as post-secondary. But now the issue is that we've changed just a few of these variables in highest education. We've recoded just a few, but all the other ones are set to NA. So this is pretty problematic. We want to recode, but we don't want to lose information. Well, there's a very simple way to handle this. It's that we want to keep all the other rows with their default value. So now let's write this again without forgetting the case one statement. All right, it's uh, case one. And then we have our highest education in, so once again, same thing, university, doctorate. And then this will be coded as post-secondary. And then our true condition argument will be highest education. And this is going to keep the default variables. All right, if we run this, there you go. There you see that this is what we want. We have kept all the information about secondary, primary, um, but we have also recoded university and doctorate into one category, which is post-secondary. And so this is how you put here a variable on the right hand side of your true statement and this in this manner you keep all the other values all the unmatched values remain the values by default all right your turn to try it out we're going to do something a bit similar in the flu data set so we're going to take the outcome variable and we're going to replace the value recover by recovery. And I'll see you back here in a bit. Let's now see our next thematic. So our next topic, which is how to write a case one statement that is using multiple conditions on a single variable. This time it's our left hand side of the tilde which is going to be affected. So it's going to be writing a condition that has multiple parts. So basically a multi-condition. Let's have an example with the BMI variable which you have previously encoded in the mutate lesson. So this should bring back some memories. We're going to create um, a Yaoundé BMI where as we have done in mutate we're going to convert the height in centimeters to meters, and then we are going to also define the BMI variable. Then we're going to apply case one to this new variable. All right, so the height 
in centimeters divided by 100 for meters. And then the BMI is, so the weight in kilogram divided by the height in meters power square. And then we're going to select just the BMI because we want to just have a look at this for the rest of our tree. So there we go. We have our BMI here that has been de defined when which we will be using for what comes next. The BMI is a health indicator and you can really define different states of health using it. So a healthy BMI is defined between 18.5 and 25. So the person has a normal overall weight for their height. Um, the BMI is considered as underweight if the person has a BMI which is inferior to 18.5. The BMI is considered an, an indicator of overweight if it's between 25 and 30. And then finally, people are considered obese if their BMI is above 30. What you can see is that usually this is going to imply multiple conditions on the BMI values. So how are we going to write this? Well, we are going to take the case one statement to make a classification. So we're going to start with the first condition, which is that people who have a BMI between 18.5 and 25 have a normal weight. So we are going to use the BMI variable and we're going to say if it's basically superior to 18.5 and the BMI is inferior to 25. Actually, let's make that an inferior equal. That way we account for all the cases. Then this person has a normal weight. Then if we have our second condition, which is for people who are underweight, it's a BMI that's inferior to 18.5, and this is categorized as underweight. What am I writing? <laughs> now, the next one is about people who are overweight. So once again, it's a dual condition. The BMI has to be superior or equal to 25, and the BMI has to be inferior to 30. So it's two conditions once again, and this we would input overweight. And finally, if the BMI is superior to 30, well, superior or equal to 30, then we are going to input that the person is obese. So here you have different kinds of conditional statements. Here you have single conditions for underweight and obese. And then for the other two, you have dual conditions, so two conditions that are defining your overall condition for inputting that value. So now, if we run this, we see that we get a very fine grain categorization of people. So some people are obese, others are overweight, normal weight, and in this manner, we can learn very interesting things about our data set. Here we're going to use Tableau to have a look at what we get once we are looking at the application of this health indicator. And what we see is quite interesting. So we see that we have no NA values in our variable. It's a good way of having a quick look at your data set because you make categories that make sense to you. And then you can quickly look at the proportions that you have inside your data set. It's your turn to have some practice. So we're going to use the flu line list data and we're going to make a new column called adolescent that has the value yes if the person is in the age group 10 to 19 years old and the value no for everyone else. Have a go at it and see you very soon. Welcome back. I hope that went well. So as I spoiled earlier, after multiple conditions on a single variable, what was going to come naturally is that we're going to do multiple conditions on multiple variables. So this is going to be, once again, impacting the left-hand side. We have, at the moment, involved a single variable at a time, but you can have multiple variables in your multiple conditions. 
that are going to define an, a, some kind of case classification. We're going to see an example that is using age years and sex, and we would see how we combine conditions on these two variables to make um, what we will call recruiting groups. So let's start by selecting both of these variables, so age years and sex, and we're going to make a subset called Yaoundé age sex. There we go, we have our two variables here and here. We're going to imagine that we want to basically subset our existing data into women and men who are between 20 and 29, and we want to subset this into two different studies. So we're going to make a new variable called recruit that has the following definition. We're going to code women who are aged between 20 and 29 as recruit to female study, men who are between 20 and 29 as recruit to male study, and then everyone else will be coded as do not recruit. Let's make this new recruit variable. So let's create our case one statement. We are going to have, so the age years is always going to have the same condition. So it's going to be superior to 20 and age years inferior to 29. So let's actually make these inclusive. So let's add equals. There we go. That way we're taking people who are also 20, also 29. And then for our first one, we're also going to put a condition on the sex. So we're going to want the sex to be female. And then if all of these three conditions are filled out, so a dual condition on age and then a condition on gender, then we are going to define this as recruit to female study. There we go. That's our first one. Then for men, we have the same condition on age years. So there we go. Older than 20 and also younger than 30. And then the sex is this time equal to male. And this we recruit to male study. And then for everyone else, we use true. And we set do not recruit. We get a very clear categorization of people who we want for our studies and people who we do not. So we do not, you see that here we have a 45 year old female, which we will not recruit. Same for the next line, who is a 55 year old male. We will also not recruit someone who has missing information. So for example, here it's missing the age. So this person will not be recruited. And then for anyone who is matching our conditions, so a 23 year old male, he will be recruited to the male study and a 20 year old female will be recruited to the female study. Now it's your turn to practice. You will be making a new column also called recruit. So very similar task, which will be following us the following definition. So individuals that are aged between 30 and 59 and that are from the Jiangsu province will be categorized as recruit to Jiangsu study. And then individuals who are aged 30 to 59 from the Zhejiang province, apologies for pronunciation, um, will be categorized as recruit to Zhejiang study. And if anyone cares to write to me in the comment how this is pronounced, please do. Um, and everyone else will be categorized as do not recruit. So very similar to what we just did, just this time, instead of using information about gender, you'll be using geographical information. So have a go and see you back in a minute. So welcome back. Now we're going to touch upon something that we already kind of looked at using the true argument of case one. It is the order of priority of conditions in case one. But if you have these types of conditions, you may have an issue with the order. Let's have a look at first this example where we have our categorization, which is people inferior to 18 as child, people inferior to 30 young adults, and people who are younger than 120 years old, which are older adults. 
120 is quite old. And we get our categorization. Everything is fine. We have our older adults as older adults, our young adults, our children that are categorized. Everything is perfect. But you may notice one thing, and it is that the age conditions overlap. That means that technically anyone between 0 and 120 should be categorized as older adult, even a baby. But this does not occur. And the reason for this is that case one is like a series of branching logical steps. So this is an illustration. We wrote first our condition about child. So everyone got categorized as child who is below 18. Otherwise, it went to the second condition. People who are below 30 were categorized as young adults. And those remaining kind of were the last ones to whom this condition was applied. So it's really this branching where if you have the first condition that regroups people, then everyone else that's remaining gets the second condition applied. And then again, everyone else remaining has the third condition applied and so on and so forth. So whatever condition you put first will be applied to everyone. And then the condition that you put second will be applied to anyone who hasn't been matched by the condition. Let's see a bit more about this. Now imagine we change the order. We now have older adult first, then young adult, then child. Well, if you've understood this branching phenomenon, you'll see that basically in this situation, everyone gets, ca gets categorized as older adult. And the reason is that everyone does match this condition. So the first thing that is applied to everyone is to check if they're below 120 years old, which they are because everyone is generally below 120 years old. And so they all get categorized older adults. And then when it moves to this otherwise, well, it's simply that there's no one left here to categorize as below 30 because everyone already fit this first condition. So this shows you the importance of the order of your conditions. You can avoid this if you write closed bound conditions. So closed bound conditions will be writing out intervals of numbers. So it's what we did, for example, for the BMI. The BMI, we wrote closed bound intervals, which means 18.5 to 25, 25 to 30. And we didn't leave open ended conditions. So let's rewrite our initial conditions as closed bounded conditions. So we have age years inferior to 18, which is child. That we agree. This is sufficient to define it. However, for young adults, we're going to write age years that is superior or equal to 18 and age years that is inferior to 30. And this will be our young adult. And then for the older adult, we're going to have oopsie, age years, which is superior or equal to 30, and age years inferior to 120. And this will be older, an older adult. Now, when we run this, we get the same thing as before. So you may not see it right away, but the beauty of it is that we can kind of switch around our conditions. Look at what I'm going to do. We're going to put this condition first. So there we go. So we're going to take away this comma here. Oopsie. And this is still going to work. There we go. Now we have put this older adult condition before, and we could have also maybe switched around the young adult condition. You can basically put them in whatever order you want if they are closed bound conditions. If they are open conditions, it's very important to keep in mind what is their order. The other reason that we need to know this is because there are case scenarios where you may want to use open ended conditions. It's not always possible to write them closed bounded so that there's no doubt about your conditions. We're going to see an example of this with, while using the COVID-19 symptoms variable. 
So the symptoms columns means that it's symptoms experienced by respondents during a six month period. We're going to define whether a person may have had COVID following their symptoms and following the guidelines of WHO. So what does this mean? We're going to define that someone who had a cough, it's possible that it's a COVID case. If someone had anosmia or agusia, so a loss of smell or taste, then it's a probable COVID case. And you have to keep in mind that probable is more likely than possible, which means that anosmia, agusia are more significant symptoms than cough. So this is kind of the rules, the definitions of how we are going to write out um, our categorization of if people are possible, probable COVID cases. We're also going to define um, a respondent of particular interest, and her name is Ozma. Ozma has both cough and anosmia agusia symptoms. So she has both symptoms that would label her as both possible COVID and or probable COVID. Now, how should we categorize her? I'll let you think on that, maybe even pause the video. Well, I hope you had the intuition that we should classify Ozma as a probable COVID case because this, um, the condition for probable COVID, so having anosmia agusia symptoms, takes precedence over the criterion for possible COVID, which is the cough meaning the information about this symptom is more important than about this symptom, and it should have more importance. So let's see what this looks like when we're going to code it up. So we're gonna start by selecting our symptom columns. So there we go, first one and second one. Then we're gonna select only certain individuals, which are going to illustrate the situation we want to highlight. So we're going to select four individuals that have the indexes that I'm typing out right now. We're going to create this object. There we go. We have very different cases. And now we are going to create our case one and we're going to start by setting a condition on the symptom anosmia, anosmia or agusia. If this is yes, then we have defined that this is a probable COVID, and then if our symptom is cough, then we have defined that this is a possible, oopsie, forgot, possible COVID. So when we run this, what we see is that we get a correct classification. We get that someone who had a cough symptom is classified as possible COVID, but anyone who had anosmia or agusia symptoms are classified as probable COVID. As for people who had no symptoms, they're just an NA classification because we didn't kind of set up a situation on how we wanted to annotate them. We could, for example, set the true to, for example, not COVID if we wanted to label those instead of having them be NA. But now, what happens if we switch around the conditions? That means here, coming down to this part, we see that here, the only thing that has changed is that the, the condition on cough being yes and defining possible COVID is before the anosmia or agusia condition. So let's see what this looks like. There, all of a sudden, we no longer have osma classified in the right way because once again, with this branching phenomenon, she fell into the classification of cough as possible COVID, so she wasn't even considered to be classified as probable COVID, even though this symptom anosmia or agusia variable is also set to yes. So this is very important to show why maybe in this situation uh, you should pay attention to the order of your conditions. Or you would have to add a condition to ensure that you are classifying rig rigorously. So imagine you want to first handle this possible COVID um, classification. Then you would set symptom cough is equal, equal to yes. And you would add a condition, which would be that symptom anosmia or agusia is not equal to yes. This way, it says that if you have someone like Ozma who have both equal to yes, 
then it will transit to the second evaluation word and it will classify her correctly as probable COVID. Let's verify this when we run this. There we go. Now we have our correct classification. This is a question of how you want to structure your code, how many conditions you want to have in there. The idea is always to have the clearest code. So if you ask me for my opinion, something like this, the more you add conditions, the more rigorous you are, will make that you will not have these errors. So it really depends on your level of confidence in what you are doing. It's, already, it's always better to be safe than sorry with your conditions. Now it's your turn to practice, where you're going to take the flu data set and you're going to create a new column called follow-up priority that is going to implement the following decision. So women should be considered as high priority. All children under 18 years old of any gender should be considered highest priority and everyone else should have the value no priority. Have a go at it and I'll see you back here in a, in a little minute. Now we will be seeing the last part of the lesson so we're going to actually leave aside case one. I hope you're not too sad. If else is structured that if the condition is true then one operation is applied else the alternative is applied so it's very it's only for binary conditions and it can always be written as a case one statement so you don't have to know or use if else but it's important that you maybe have seen it that way if you use someone else's code you will know what it is doing so let's see a bit let's take our example of recoding the highest education variable this is something we did not too long ago this is the version we explored with case one so when we run it, imagine you want to do the same with if else. Well, this is how we would be doing it. So if else takes a condition and then it takes two other um, arguments. It takes the argument of if it is true and if it is false. And for us in this situation, if it is true, we want to recode university and doctorate to post-secondary. And if it is false, we want to have the default variable, the default value of our variable. So let's look into this. Let's not forget the comma, very important. And then here we will put highest education as an example. So basically what this is saying is that if this condition is true, then we recode post-secondary. If it is false, then we keep the default variable. And when we run this, you will see that we get exactly the same thing as above using the case one statement. The last practice question of the day, you're going to be using the fluid lineless data and you're going to be making an, the age group column once again with below 50 and 50 and above. It's at this time you're going to use the if else function. So it's exactly the same question as in your uh, as the first practice question. Then you're going to write it with an if else statement. So congratulations, you now master within mutate the two additional helper verbs case one and if else. It is such an essential part of transformations, this transformation on conditions, that it deserved its very own lesson. So really pay attention, take your time to become familiar with case one and if else is going to be extremely handy in your future data wrangling and I look forward to treating our next topic very soon. Bye bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today.